Hey, what's up, Chris? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Um, before we get started, it'd be great to just get your background and um, you know a story of how you got to where you are today and what your connection to remote work is. Yeah, so I'm um, Chris Dyer. I'm the CEO of People G2. Uh, I run an organization that's 100% remote. Uh, between my staff, my independent contractors, and everyone involved, there's about 3,000 people. So um, we have uh, sort of went to remote because we had to. Uh, back in 2009, we went to remote be- for financial reasons and found out that it was a way better way to work, that it was uh, actually an improvement on what we were doing. And it was kind of one of those nice accidents. You know, we went into it for like totally ridiculous reasons to save money, but found out it was awesome. So I've had the privilege of now being able to speak all around the world and talk about remote work because we've been doing it for so long, uh, full time, that it's kind of second nature, but we really, we like to play around with it. We like to try to find ways to be better at it and not just you know, kind of send people home to work and pretend that we're all in an office, which is not what we're doing. So hope that makes sense. Can you tell me a bit about, let's, let's take it back to when you first transitioned over to remote work. Um, what was that process like and what were those early days of remote work like for you and your team? So, you know, we had a few people that were excited about it and everyone else, I would say 80% of the people were like, we'll do it because you said so. And then we had 10% people kicking and screaming and I learned a lesson then to have the people who are really excited talk to the people who are kicking and screaming. All the people in the middle were just going to sort of do it no matter what. Um, But we learned early on that we had to change how we decided what uh, what was success, how to measure people or good KPIs. We didn't have a really good sense of that. We thought we did. And once we went remote, we realized we didn't. And so early on, we found out that like in some scenarios, people who we thought were our best workers in a particular department turned out to be our worst and some of our worst turned out to be our best because when we started really measuring correctly when work was being assigned democratically that no one could cherry pick the easy stuff you know there was a lot of things going on we didn't realize and going remote kind of really made things very democratic very equal across the board and that was a big big learning lesson for us but it also we had to have some difficult conversations and realizing that not everyone was exactly what we thought they were. That's interesting that you point that out because a lot of employers, I think, think that you can really see employee engagement much more effectively when everyone's coming into the office. But in your case, you're more easily able to determine who was engaged and who was effective when they weren't coming into the office. Exactly. People uh, are we are full of cognitive biases. Our brains are trying to trick us all day long, not because it wants to deceive us, but because it's trying to help us make decisions quicker and faster and deal with all of the information and stimulus that's coming our way. And so it's very easy to assume that, and this is called the halo effect, that person who dresses nice, that person who looks nice, that we think looks attractive, that does nice pretty work or speaks really well, that they must be doing a really good job. And that is not necessarily the case. And then um, we also have this kind of, I think, old school way of thinking about things. If we see people looking like they're busy and we hear papers rustling and we hear staplers going and we see people huddled and having meetings, well, they must be productive. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And going remote showed me that that was complete crap and that wasn't in any way a good way to to gauge how people were actually functioning inside the organization. So when you rolled out this new method of measuring employee performance, can you talk to a bit about what the process was like for you to create the new framework and how you interacted with the different leaders of your uh, business units? So we really took, you know, that the, the agile scrum you might want to call it the google model i mean just sort of like we need to work in teams 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 all the time and by having more team interactions that really helped us have communication have collaboration have effective meetings um and not we learned early on that the one-on-one meetings were killing us so we were really going slow we kind of you know really had this natural slow dip which should be expected as we were figuring it out we didn't have any like role models out there showing us what we should be doing. 
And we figured out that you know, some teams were really going fast. And we realized that they were only meeting as a team and that they were pretty much not meeting one-on-one, whereas other groups, you know, I pick up the phone, I call you, I talk to you about something, we hang up, I call the next person, we talk about it. And I've done that five times today. That has been my entire day on top of the other stuff I need to do. Instead, we could get one 15-minute phone call for the five of us, figure out what we need to talk about, exchange ideas, and get off the phone and go, go do stuff. That's 15 minutes versus five hours of work. And so by collaborating and making team uh, meetings, um, it really helped us to go faster. That was the first discovery. Uh, the second discovery was then how we had to change how those teams met on a consistent basis as well. So that, that daily stand-up concept is um, really important to Scrum and, and Agile. And lots of software development teams use it. Um, did you deploy this concept um, across the entire organization or was it just in specific areas like marketing or sales or yeah, all, all the time? And so we don't do a quote unquote daily standup. Um, sales sort of does, but everyone else, we don't really have a daily standup because our work is pretty consistent. It's not like building software where every day you're coming in with a completely different set of challenges or you're, you're, you're at a different part on the, the backlog, right? I mean, this is very different. Um, for us. So we have a bit more consistency. But what we do have is suddenly a wrench gets thrown into the mix. Suddenly a client calls and they have this issue or suddenly this cord is down and we have, we have something internal to deal with. And that's the moment when we need someone just to say, hey guys, can we just get on the phone real quick for 15 minutes and, and do it? So it's, it's, it's a stand up, but it's not necessarily at 8 a.m. or at 5 p.m. or whatever. It's less consistent like that. Um, we do take on a lot of agile, uh, kind of methodologies when we do special projects though. So 90% of our work is very consistent. It happens all the time. We deal with those anomalies as they come in, but we do have projects. We want to get a new software. We want to have a new product offering, whatever it may be. And in that regard, then we definitely do take a very, you know, have our daily scrum meeting. We're having our retrospectives. We're having our planning poker. We're doing all that kind of stuff. So if I'm a recruiting manager and I'm listening to this, um, I might only need to implement a weekly uh, stand-up meeting with my recruiting team. But if I'm a director of innovation or IT that's rolling out a digital transformation initiative at a staffing company or at a large corporate recruiting department, I might need to do a more frequent daily stand-up to keep the project rolling and keep everyone on the same page. Right. Yeah. If you're in a project, you definitely should be having a daily meeting. I mean, that, that, that is scrum 101, right? So, but if it's consistent work, to your point, checking in, having maybe once a week. So, you know, right now uh, with my executive team, it was our cadence to have one meeting every week uh, on, and then once a month we would get together for a full day meeting, but we had a two hour meeting once a week. Now we were on other calls together and other times, but that was our time as the executive team to come together and work. Now that we're in COVID, COVID is a special project. So we are now meeting every single day. We're doing a daily stand-up every day because there's a special need, right? When that goes away, hopefully someday, and we are all not locked in our homes, um, you know, we won't need to do that every day because we want, we're not dealing with one specific issue. Um, so everyone should kind of change it based on what they need. My philosophy is meetings are terrible, meetings suck. And don't have any more meetings than you have to. They should be as minimal as possible, as highly effective as possible. Um, no one really likes being on meetings. They know that they're a necessary evil and you can get a lot done with them. And there are a lot of good things happen out of meetings. But no one wants a thousand emails and no one wants a hundred you know, Zoom meet calls every day. It's just exhausting and you can't get your, your real work done. So try to compact them into as minimal as possible, as, as few as possible, especially those that are mandatory. So we do a thing called, ty- uh, excuse me, cockroach meetings. And these are 15 minute meetings maximum to deal with one small issue. We average about 35 of them a day across the organization and their average length is eight minutes long. They must always start on time. They never go over. In fact, they should always end early. 
and they are 100% optional. The only person who's required to show up is the person who called the meeting. And so everyone else can decide, do I have the bandwidth right now? Do I have the ability to show up and help? Or do I need to just stay back? Do I already have a call scheduled? And it's just someone to raise their hand and say, I, don't, I need help, guys. I don't know what's going on here. Client called. I don't know how to do this thing, whatever. Instead of that person spending three hours trying to figure it out on their own or calling four people and wasting their time, one eight-minute meeting and if someone goes, you know what? You need to talk to John. Then you got to talk to Sally. You need to go research this thing or here's this doc I already did. I had this problem last year. Here you go. Eight minutes, problem solved, and that person's off and going. So you really can make things far more effective. I love that concept of the cockroach meeting because I really see that as the way you replace that serendipitous inter-office communication that happens. This really sounds like a great way to replace that. Hey, let me just walk over to Jenny across the way and ask her how I can get this problem solved. And I love that they're optional. Um, I think that's a great takeaway from this from this call. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let, let's talk a bit about your your executive team and how you kind of coach them through. Um, coaching their managers through transitioning over to remote work and rolling it out across their, their department. Yeah. So do you mean like when we started or do you mean like right now as we bring people on? When we, when you started. Yeah. When we started, I mean, we were pretty um, novice at it. We were, you know, it, 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 everything that we do, I have learned that we are our best when we are trying to only get like 1% better at a time just small incremental improvements that we can actually handle. If I tell my team, you guys, you know, we, do, we just climbed a hill, now it's time to go climb Everest, people give up, they get frustrated, they, they can't possibly fathom that we could do that much work or, or get that much better. But when I just say, hey, we did, we did this 20 minute walk, now let's do 21 minutes tomorrow, that's manageable, that's hand, everyone can handle that, they can understand it. So that same philosophy, let's just get 1% better. You know, how do we help our teams a little bit more today? How do we experiment with this or change that? You know, bringing in Slack for us. Slack didn't really exist back when we very, very first started this. Or if it did, we didn't know about it. Um, but at, we first had HipChat, and then we moved on to Slack. And so Slack was really a huge thing for us to, was sort of our last big change to stop having so much email. That was a real issue for our people was the amount of volume of content they had to review and to think about. Um, and so moving over to Slack really helped us sort of eliminate that, that and allow our managers to coach their people into, you know, getting them quick information, calling those meetings. And, and, but it also allowed us that public forum to make sure we were thanking each other and celebrating victories and, and things that were good. So I, I think a lot of companies should switch over to Slack. We use Slack at Maya and it's absolutely fantastic for that collaboration as well as reducing the email inbox overload. And really we have a channel in there called Kudos where team members will give each other kudos for things that they've done well. Um, what are some of the strategies and tactics that you've deployed on Slack to make it effective and engaging that you've learned over the years of uh, operating in a remote model? Yeah, so we, um, we have a water cooler room, and uh, that room is where you can talk about anything that's work appropriate. Um, you can post pictures of your kids or your vacations, but that's also where we give people that thanks. We call them a green flag, uh, and that's where everyone goes in and says, hey, so-and-so did a great job on this project, great, you know, green flag. And then anyone else who's available who's online, they go in and throw in their green flags, and it's it's nice to, don't, to get a pat on the back. It's really nice to get 15, 20, 100 pats on the back, whoever's online at that moment. Um, you know, so that, that, that was the first thing that we did that was really, really helpful was putting in that green flag. But then we started building in tools to make our employees' lives easier. There's so many wonderful plugins for Slack. Um, we have a attendance bot that plugs in allows our hourly people to track their hours, just log, you know, I'm in, I'm out, I'm going to lunch, and it creates an entire time card for them. Uh, we use a thing called Niles, where every time an employee asks a question, we write up a really legit answer, and we put it in Niles, so the next time someone 
can say, hey, Niles, how do I do this? The answer that a manager has already told someone comes up for them. And so they can start to find the answers themselves and, util and that's all in Slack. Um, some of the things that we started doing was using a program called Vidyard to create little uh, videos to show people how to do things. So how do, you, how do you do this thing in Slack? How do you do this thing in our other program? What we found is that people really love the ability to rewatch a video and not have to ask someone a second time to explain it again. You know, they feel stupid. Someone explained it to them once and they didn't remember it all or they didn't get it all and they feel stupid asking again. And so they're wasting all this time trying to figure that out. And instead, by having this video, they can go back and watch it a hundred times and never feel stupid and get the information they need. And if it's something they didn't have to do, they only have to do once a month, it's hard to remember that. And you can go back to that video and watch it. So kind of just you, adding tools to make our employees' lives easier really, really was a great way to kind of encapsulize that whole process. Nice. So it seems like three things that, you know, staffing companies and and corporate recruiting uh, teams should be doing right now as they're switching to remote models is one, like making employees' lives easier and improving communication. Uh, two, you know, really being deliberate about setting performance goals and, and figuring out how you're measuring performance for your employees. And, and three, focusing on building educational resources for everyone that replace some of the serendipitous inter-office communication that would happen. Um, these are these are awesome tips. Um, next, I want to I want to transition into um, talking about uh, culture and really what you can do to make sure your culture um, continues to be successful in a remote work environment. Yeah. So here here's the bad news about remote work. Um, your culture has to be good. You cannot survive in a, having a remote team in a remote company if your culture sucks. It just doesn't work. And so this is going to put a lot of companies who have had bad cultures for a long time and maybe they have great benefits and they overpay and maybe there's reasons that you put up with that company or they, you know, they had a great office or you had a short commute, but now all of a sudden you're forced being home. If your culture sucks and you got a bad boss, I mean, it, it really gets amplified in the remote uh, system. So there are a lot of great things to think about. I've, I've got seven pillars in my book, The Power of Company Culture. But right now, I would say there's a couple that are super important. The first pillar that's really important is transparency. You've got to be getting people as much information as you possibly can right now, especially during a pandemic, especially when work has been changed completely. Um, and even if that information changes tomorrow, even if you don't have all the answers, you as the leader need to be providing as much information as you possibly can every single day. Um, over communicate is the key here because people, when they don't know something, you're leaving them to fill in the gaps with what they already know. And what they already know is maybe you don't like them or they're going to lose their job or whatever fear based and bit of anxiety is going to come through. So we want to be as transparent with our people as we can. The second one is the uh, pillar of positivity, which is to focus on what's working, to focus on what's right, to focus on what's good first. We definitely still deal with things that are challenges and there are opportunities for us to get better all day long. Um, you know, we, we're not going to ignore the fact that COVID is here, but we can still talk about every day what went well, who did a good job, where do we have success? and make sure that that's the first thing we talk about every day so we don't walk around all wanting to jump in front of a train or walk off a bridge. I mean, these are really difficult times right now, and if we just focus on the negative, and if we just call everything a problem and everything is, is an issue, I mean, it's, re, it, it's like getting stuck in quicksand. It's hard to get your momentum going and to really you know, keep, keep your, head up, your wits about you as you're trying to, to, to step out of this unique situation. Yeah, the 
the power of positivity as a pillar of your company culture, especially in the context of what's happening right now is so important. And there's some really interesting uh, neuroscience research on it actually Mm -hmm. about this part of your brain called the RAS or reticular activating system. And the the long and short of it is essentially our our brains have 40,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day. So we're just constantly being assaulted by thoughts. And our reticular activating system is what selects what thoughts are going to bubble up to the surface. Mm -hmm. And what these studies found is that if you wrote down gratitudes or shared gratitudes every single day, over time, you could train your reticular uh, activating system to surface more positive thoughts. So I think one great thing to include in the daily standup or even in a team Slack channel would be for everyone to post three wins for that day or three things they're grateful for. And even just doing this for a short period of time, like a two week period, um, I've done this with teams before and it's, it's extremely effective for restoring momentum and, and getting people together during tough situations. Especially when it's just, um, helping get it's it's actually a good connector to positive to transparency right because it's helping everyone understand what did go well and and you're filling in those great gaps because there's so many times when we only hear and see the negative and therefore everyone thinks the sky is falling because that's the only information they're getting on a consistent basis so it helps us bring that forward and often the executive team the managers they know this good stuff because they're being shared it across they're seeing multiple parts of the business but your average employee is only inside their world and if you don't help them get that information then they can't possibly uh, know they should be excited uh, that we got you know some new product launched or we got this big client or whatever that that win was for the day Um, what i loved about what you said earlier you know, if someone wants to find out more about this, this positivity thing, if the science stuff and, and neurology, neurologists and, 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 and that, that part of it, it really excites you, then you should go and, and research exactly the stuff that you said. If, if, if that gets that's too technical for you, go, talk, go look at appreciative inquiry. And what I love is that the, I call them the hippies, but the psychologists and the neuroscientists basically proved the exact same thing. And now they're currently coming to the exact same conferences. Now they were at their own conferences for years, ignoring each other for years. And they've each in their own discipline in their own way have proved the exact same thing, which is what you said, that positive thoughts and that positive thinking and and bringing that forward on a regular basis has such a unique effect on the brain and how we perceive our day and our people and our actual ability to be successful in the future. Yeah, and and that element of transparency and trust is something that's highly important to to workers and candidates and just everyone in general today that's active in the labor force. So what are some of the ways that you create transparency in your culture as, as the leader? So we do everything from sharing our profit and loss statement every month to our organization, sharing our sales goals, who we close, what we did, what we didn't do. We talk about any, anything that it, it, the executive team talked about that we dealt with on our big you know, day-long meetings. We uh, share that with the entire organization. Maybe it's a, a, an abridged version. We're not getting so far in the details that we're overwhelmed people. Um, but we are sharing all the information. There is nothing that I know that I have not shared in some capacity every month to everyone in the organization on that company-wide meeting we do. Um, So they know where things stand. If they want to come and ask more, great. They want to make a decision about their lives and their, uh, you know, employee employment or whatever they can. But the worst thing that can happen, and I had this before, we, we had uncertainty in the business and we had people leave. And then when they gave me their notice, it was like, well, why are you leaving? And they would tell you, well, I, you guys lost these accounts and this and that. And I go, yeah, well, yeah, we lost those, but do you know we like landed 10 more and we're like, our numbers are up. And they were like, well, I didn't know that. And they, they made a decision on the negative things they heard. They didn't know any of the positive things. And so they figured they were going to jump ship. And so, you know, if you don't give everyone all the information, they can only fill it in with, what they think they know. Um, and so we try to, to give them 
as much information, again, sort of, I, I don't I certainly want to be insulting here, but you know, you don't have a calculus teacher. You know, not everyone knows how to read a financial statement. Not everyone knows all the things that everybody knows. So I try to deliver it in a way that is accessible to everyone. And then we have an open door policy that if anyone wants to go deeper, if they want me to sit and explain to them my PL sheet, I will. I'll be happy to go into deep, deep detail if they want. What I don't want to do on the other end is come off pompous and complicated and, and overwhelm people with information that doesn't, they can't understand or they don't have the ability to, to be able to process in the right way. So, but we try to give them as much as we can uh, on every topic. So when, when I think leaders hear about transparency, especially if they're not used to it before, it's a controversial subject. Um, I think two big fears that I've seen in my research on this subject is, number one, what if employees share this information publicly or what if they leave and go to competitors and share this information? And number two, what if we're not doing so great and me sharing this information makes employees leave the company? Um, what do you, what's been your experience with those? Yeah. So fear is always what drives people not to be transparent. And you, will you lose someone? Probably. Um, will you, will someone maybe tell someone something, even though you've got them under NDAs and confidential agreements or whatever, it's possible. Um, you know, maybe if it's something highly, highly, you know, confidential and secret, you know, maybe, maybe you can't talk about specifics because they're, I mean, if you're, if you have the secrets to how to make, you know, some missile or whatever, yeah, maybe you're not going to give away things that could be sensitive. You have to, you have to design that what's best for your company. But I think in most regards, not being transparent, you lose far more people and you cause far more problems in your organization when people are making up their minds and making decisions on bad information. I can't tell you when we, we were not very transparent prior to going remote and I used to have people get hired and it, you could watch it. It was like, it, it was like a, a groundhog day. Even if you remember that movie with Bill Murray, it was groundhog day every day with new employees. They had the same ideas. They had the same questions, right? It was, it was the same thing. You'd watch them as they learn more and more about our business and they would, they'd run in my office. Oh, I had this great idea. And like, you knew exactly what that idea was because the last 10 people had that same thing. Right. And we realized when we started being transparent, when we were hiring people and we provided them information in advance, they stopped having that groundhog day scenario and instead actually started coming to me with fresh ideas and really great perspective because I gave them the information in advance. I didn't allow them just to, stumble through it and, and, and discover it on their own. I was providing really good resources in advance and getting far better results from people who are far, far smarter than I am in most areas of what they do and coming up with much better information. But again, if they don't know what's in my head, they can't possibly come to me with good, with good ideas and, and make good decisions. Uh, we're leaving them sort of uh, handicapped in that sense of they can't, you know, if they can't do that, if they have some block there, then it's a real challenge for them. And, you know, that is worse than what would happen if you told, like, if your business isn't doing well right now, which a lot of businesses aren't, the best thing business is doing bad, except for maybe Amazon and the grocery store, right? I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> the best thing is to share that information with your employees and be very, very transparent about it. And this, uh, this reminds me of the story of this company um, that I have this article on the Maya blog about transparency in the workplace. And I did a whole bunch of research on the subject. And I found out about this story about this company called CPO Commerce that was operating at like four or five quarters of straight losses. And they were really struggling. And what they decided to do is just completely open up just like you did with their employees. And what they saw is actually their retention rate went up and actually no one quit the company the entire six month period while they were recovering from that. Right. And what employees started to do because they knew what was going on is they started to come in with fresh ideas, just like you said. And it was that that helped the business suck, like weather that storm and make it out. And they're still right. operating today. So it, transparency is, is a proven concept. It works, it's effective, and it's better than trying to hide things from people because 
your employee's imagination is always going to be 10 times worse than the actual truth of it. Yeah. And it goes back to even when I was talking about showing our profit and loss statement, we started getting people who had these way better ideas about how to save money in particular areas because they understood where we were spending our money. We had people making better decisions about how to spend our money because they understood what it meant to the bottom line and they understood how we were doing, you know, it's very easy for an employee just to assume that I'm spending all the money on a yacht and my wine collection or something ridiculous, right? Which neither, neither exist, but um, it, you know, and when they actually see the numbers and they see what's really happening, then they get invested in a much different way and they feel like they're a real part of it. Um, and, and people, really start to think about better ways to help you run your, your own business. Yeah, that's, that's really this concept of um, the networked organization, which is essentially still a developing field, but um, we have so much data available to us today uh, in big data. And then also just in the existing models that we have, like our um, financial statements. And there's also data in all of our employees about their day-to-day -day operations. And until you have that level of transparency where you're sharing the results with the people that are operating, you're never gonna get those ideas that are really gonna impact operations in the right way mm -hmm. to, to completely change your, your financial results. And that, that concept is really how do you create data movement across all the nodes. If you think of your employees as nodes in a network of your organization, and the more networked your nodes are, the more, the more powerful and high performing your organization is going to be. So like this trusted transparency is absolutely critical to make it through this uh, coronavirus pandemic and market slowdown. Yeah. You know, the third sort of area that goes into that, um, and we started to talk about it indirectly in is, so the, the, the pillar of my book is called measurement and systems. And I'm a big advocate of Scrum and Agile, but it was actually us bringing that into our organization that allowed people to start being experimenters. And I think this is a big part of what, where, how this works is if you have people who are willing to try new things and to experiment and then and to have ideas, then they can see if they work and if you're going to be transparent about the results and everyone's going to talk about did it work or did it fail. Uh, and we're going to celebrate that either way right? We're going to celebrate failure. We're going to celebrate the fact that you tried something, even if it didn't work out. But it took us bringing in a system. And I, I learned that I'm just naturally an experimenter. I like to try things. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, okay, we'll try something new. But most of my people are not. They're, they, would, they don't want to make a mistake or they don't want to, you know, try something and waste money or whatever, like they're, how that might look or you know, they don't have naturally that sort of freedom. But when I put in that system of Scrum and they realized that they had a process of this is how we determine it, this is how we meet, this is how we judge if it was successful, we have a retrospective. All of a sudden, I got people running experiments all the time and it's the same people. But they just needed a framework on how to do that. And instead of it just being willy-nilly, let's just go spend 20 bucks on this program and see what happens, they, they weren't willing to try that if they couldn't set up the rules of the game. Uh, I guess it's sort of like asking people to go play sports. And if they don't know any sports, if they don't know the rules of, of any of the sports, how can you expect them to go play sports? Um, they need to have some framework so they can cooperatively work with other people in a way that they've all agreed that they're going to cooperate and do that thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, building out that sports analogy, like let's, let's talk about football, right? So if, if your team doesn't even know that they need to get a first down or that they need to get a touchdown, how are they going to create that play or strategy to get past the defense, which is whatever environment or situation you're facing right. in your current context? Um, I, I love that. And I think staffing recruiting companies and recruiting departments at large corporations are slowly starting to adopt this mindset of we need to innovate and we need to give our employees frameworks to experiment. And what, what I've seen at least um, at Maya and through the clients that we work with is that the companies that are shifting to a more trust uh, based model, a more transparency based model and a model where experimentation is encouraged and a specific process has been laid out for it are the ones that are building competitive advantage because the, the future is defined by technology and then what you do with organizational behavior when your culture meets that technology. And 
applying all these pillars you're sharing is really how you build that company that can weather all the disruptive changes that happen from a tech and market standpoint, as well as those black swan events like coronavirus. Right. And, and, and if you haven't built your organization yet, it's hard to go back and try to, uh, to do that now while you're in crisis. I mean, right now people are just trying to survive. Um, my organization is trying to figure out, uh, we already had three ideas on new product and services we could be offering. People already identify we're going to be down. How do we capitalize on some new market and some new bit of, and they already, they did that on their own. Like I had ideas in my inbox when I, and in my Slack, when I woke up, you know, three days into COVID of us coming home, people had ideas and, and already started to do that. So, um, you got to start building that in, even if you haven't built that in yet, it's not too late, but you have to start that process. And then I'll go back to something I said earlier. You're not going to go from zero to a hundred in a day. You're going to have to go from zero to one first and then from one to two and from two to three. It is a slow, small process to really get people to, to change and to believe and to, and to trust that, that process. Yeah. I think, um, what, what you can really look at this remote work and COVID pandemic. Um, and you know, it, it is, it's not a positive thing. I'm not saying that, and I'm not encouraging that you look at it in a positive way, but what it can be is an opportunity for you to transform the way your business operates and do it in a radical new way. Um, and if you look at um, startup companies, for example, startup companies are almost always in a do or die scenario. And they essentially, their cultures need to be cultures that innovate very, very quickly and operate with a high degree of autonomy and trust because otherwise the company can go entirely out of business. And that's kind of now what these larger companies are facing is these market conditions that are putting a lot of pressure on them, just like a startup, but their culture isn't aligned to the right culture that they would need to, to you know, creatively problem solve and come out of this on top. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the difference is there, if you are one of a few people in a startup, no matter what you're selling or doing, you're, we sort of understand that those people are in it. They may be in it for a, a good reason, but at the very least, they're hoping they get rich, right? They're hoping their idea goes big and their company gets big and they own shares and they were there at the beginning and they're going to have this great you know, outcome for their lives. And so for everyone else in the organization that did, wasn't there on you know, employee number two or employee number three, you had better have a real good purpose you better, people better really understand why they're there. And that's the difference in what's lacking between someone in a startup who's just a few people. They know why they're there. They understand the purpose. They understand the potential outcome and benefit to them. Well, you have, you're employee number 132. It's a totally different scenario. And I think people forget that they have to make sure those people are aligned financially, uh, uh, to their job, to, to what they're doing, but also to the purpose. Why are, does this company exist and what is it we're doing that's going to change the world or help our communities or solve a problem for a customer, whatever it is. And, and often those people have no clue because no one ever bothered to explain it to them or to help them understand what their purpose is. Um, if, if your employees cannot tell you what your company's purpose is right now, that's the first thing you ought to do after you watch this, <laughs> after you're listening here to us talk today is go back and educate people because it makes a huge difference. So if, if you're seeing low employee engagement, things are taking longer than they used to. Um, maybe people are even leaving, although that's, that's highly doubtful in, uh, with the current job market being the way it is. I doubt anyone would want to leave the company unless they had another offer. But if, if you're at least seeing a slowdown in operations and a disengagement that you're not used to seeing, um, what, what might that be indicative of? Seeing that sort of change, I mean, people leave their jobs most of the time because their manager sucks because leadership sucks. I mean, that is the number one reason why people leave. It's not, they don't leave for more money. They don't leave for a better title. Happens sometimes. Um, they can get recruited for that stuff. But people rarely say, you know what, that's it. I've had enough. I want to, I want to go from director to VP. I want to make 10 more thousand. I'm going to leave because I want to go make 10 more thousand. They might get recruited. And that, again, that's different. 
But people leave when they get fed up and they don't want to do what they're doing anymore. It's because leadership sucks. And, and, and so we, that is something we can control. I can't control if Google calls one of my employees and offers them twice the money and a better title. I can't control that. I can only do what I can do. But I can make sure that as a leader, we're doing the best we can, that my, my team is managing them the best we can and we create the best environment we can and that we keep them as long as we can, uh, knowing and, and, and making sure that we are not living under this false pretense that when someone comes to work for me, that they're going to work here forever. That is not a likely scenario. Um, there are exceptions, but in most cases, you're, you're signing people up for a tour of duty. You know, they're kind of come in and you can expect that they should be here. If you, you do a good job recruiting and you've aligned everything, they should be there for a few years before you're having another conversation with them about a new project, a promotion, a change, or is it time for them to go find another job? Um, and being realistic about that, about all of the things you can control is really what it's about and not trying to play defense against the things you can't control. Yeah. As, as a fellow, uh, avid reader, that, that term that's from Reed Hoffman's book, right? Um, I, I love that book. Excellent, yeah. excellent book on talent. Um, so what are, what are some of the things or processes that you've put into place to, help with the unique challenges that, you know, your employees and your culture is running into because of coronavirus? Yeah. So, I mean, we're taking advantage of the stimulus. So we're making sure we're paying people at full levels. Our hourly people are getting their full hourly salary or uh, pay right now um, so that they can feed their families and keep going and, and, and limit that anxiety. And we're going to take advantage of those things that the government has put in place we use this as an opportunity for us to find, to change and to find new ways of operating and to do some of the projects that we never had time to get to, um, to really help, you know, ideas to come out of this better, to come out of this uh, a stronger, better company. Our sales may not be better <laughs> when we come out of this, but certainly our organization can be better when we come out of this. Um, we've also changed our, uh, our communication uh, cadence. Um, and so we're, you know, meeting with in, in company-wide meetings and in team meetings, we're doing more to make sure that we are over communicating here and we are doing more to make sure that we are asking people how they're doing and dealing with their, how they're doing mentally every single day. Our goal is that every single day, at least one person asks someone how they're doing with everything right now, that they're having an opportunity to share their frustrations, their anxieties, their, you know, whatever it may, it might just be they're sick and tired of their kids and their spouse because they're all home and stuck in the one, but whatever that thing is, they're having the opportunity to share that and talk about that, that we're doing our best to help them manage that. Um, and, you know, as time goes on, hopefully they'll, they'll need that less and less, but right now we're trying to be one part employer, one part therapist, you know, just to, to do everything we can to help. Um, what about things like performance reviews? Are those on hold now because um, of the situation? Are you guys still still planning on doing them at the set dates? So I hate the annual reviews. I don't do reviews. Um, my, my thing with reviews, it's basically like this entire scenario where you set people up to be, um, someone's going to be frustrated either the employer or the employee. Rarely do two people come together and they're completely on the same page and it all ended up great, right? And additionally, it sets you up for, they, all, that they deserve some change in their compensation or whatever. And that may not be the scenario at that time. So what we have changed that to is we, our managers are coaching our people and they typically, depends on the department, but between one, one to two weeks time, they are meeting with their, uh, direct manager and they're having a review level conversation smaller because it's in incremental times right but they're having those discussions are they on track are they meeting their goals are they on for their kpis we have removed this this idea of an annual thing which is such a burden on the managers and such a uh, an anxiety ridden thing for employees and we have, you know, we've sort of figured out what's that cadence to deal with pay and all that other stuff differently. So 
we identified a while ago, what were the things we hated most about work? And the annual review was one of them. And so we just got rid of them. And it has, it has been fantastic for us. Um, it's worked really well. It took a little bit of time for people to get used to it. But they actually, they prefer to be able to have their boss tell them, you're on track. No, you're not on track. You know, you're meeting your goals. No, you're not meeting your goals. Let's, how do we fix that? Every one to two weeks, then they are waiting once a year to find out that their boss thought they did a crappy job, right? And then suddenly being surprised, thinking they were doing a great job. Not to mention, it's like, those things are crap. They, you always feel like you can't rate people as high as you really want to rate them because you got to leave enough room for them to grow. I mean, it's just a bunch of, I don't know. I might be getting too off the, off the beaten path here, but I just, we hate them, so we got rid of them. Um, you know, I, I share your sentiment about annual reviews. I don't, I don't like them. I find them stressful. I never feel comfortable rating myself a five out of five on things because I'm, I'm yeah. just like, wow, that's completely, um, I don't know, big headed of me to do. Um, but what I like about the model um, when, when you step away from annual reviews, and I think even just adjusting that can make such a huge difference to your culture right now. So even if you just change how often your managers are meeting with your employees and giving them feedback to a weekly or biweekly cadence, um, that is going to do so much for your for your culture right now, especially because you're in a remote working environment. People aren't hearing from each other. People aren't getting feedback. And have your managers talk to them more. And then also having your directors and VPs talk to your managers more is really going to help foster that culture of transparency and trust that you want to build in this environment. And it's also going to help basically any changes you make at the top trickle down through the ranks much more much more effectively and be felt. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I learned this the hard way. Uh, you know, we, I had someone come to me, this is before we were, went remote, and she asked for a raise, and I went, what? You, I'm sorry, what? Like, and, and we, ha we were on two totally different planets. She thought she was doing a great job. She thought she deserved a raise because she had been here a long time. And I'm thinking, you're like, we haven't fired you. Do you realize that you're like, you're like barely making the cut? Like you, we were constantly having to coach you and help you and like get you where you need to be. And I realized we weren't doing a good job of communicating wh where we really were because we weren't having those frank discussions. We weren't having those uncomfortable conversations. We were all pretending that everything was okay. And that just doesn't work. So you got to be willing, you know, I, if I found out that someone in my company did not know exactly where they stand with their boss, it, I would lose my mind, right? Because they should be meeting with them on a regular basis. They should be having frank conversations and they should know exactly where they stand. 99% um, of the time, I would say it, it's good, which is great. Um, but they should know where they stand. Absolutely. And getting those written quantifiable metrics that are very intentional for how you're measuring employee performance, just like we talked about early on the episode, is also really important because if you don't give that to your managers, how are they gonna evaluate the employee? Every manager is gonna evaluate the employee in a different way. Every manager, based on their personality, is gonna put bias, bias into how they're evaluating the employee. Like for example, if a manager just doesn't feel comfortable telling the truth to their employee about how they're performing, that's right. just going to be a difficult conversation for them to have. And it's already hard for managers to have difficult conversations with employees. And then when you're compounding that, that you're doing it over a remote context, it suddenly becomes even more challenging. So this is almost really more of a test of your culture. And um, if you're struggling as a business right now in Corona, it's indicative that you need to fix your culture. And I think a lot of the things you shared, uh, pretty much actually everything you shared um, on the podcast today uh, is a great step to take to improve your culture. So if you had to sum it up into, into values for leaders and managers to think about, what, what values would you say to focus on? Because all this um, strategy and tactical talk can, can get really overwhelming. As far as values go, I mean, I'm a big proponent of everyone being identifying and sharing about what their values are. Um, and everyone's values are different. Uh, well, I, I should say, especially like the the four or five values that you really, really connect with are, are, are very individual. Now, your organization can have values and they often reflect the CEOs or the, the executive team's sort of shared values at times. And those should be um, certainly 
you know, communicated so people can align themselves with them or say, you know what, this is not, I don't care about these values on it and I don't, I don't want, I don't want to work here. I'll go somewhere else. Um, but it should be transparent. So we do go through an exercise with people. Um, we do this a lot with our managers, especially where we ask them to, to identify like their top 10 um, values. And then we have them cut it down to like six the day before. And then when they show up at the meeting, they got to cut it down to like four or five. And so we're asking, it takes a little bit of time to kind of really decide what your real values are. And you can, Bene Brown's done a bunch of this. I think you can pull off her uh, list of values on her website for free. And you can use those as a great examples of what values are. Um, but we go around and share them. We talk about them. And we, we want, our goal is the, from the leadership standpoint is to be very clear on what our values are and then to communicate those to our direct reports so they know exactly what we care about and who we are. We hope that they're going to do the same thing, that they will understand what their values are. But if you don't understand what your boss's values are, how they perceive the world, everything, I mean, one of my top five values is travel, is this value of travel. I love travel. I love to meet new people. I love to eat new things. I love new experiences. I love to find some place that nowhere, maybe no one else in the world even knows about. Like, that's a thing that I value, right? And that's not like that's not justice. That's not honesty. That's not, it's a very unique kind of weird thing that like travel would be in my top five. Well, if you know that about me, you have a better, it's much, much easier to interact with me and have, and have a, a conversation with me as someone who's my direct report. Um, if someone has patriotism as one of their values, you can kind of understand them you know, differently than someone else who might have something, a, another type of value. So it just helps us connect as people and organizations should identify their values so that uh, employees can connect to the organization through those values as well or opt out if that's the right thing to do. All right, Chris. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, I had such a great time talking to you about company culture and remote work and managing the transition. Um, so where are places people can go to learn more about your perspective on culture and um, what does people G2 do and how can you help um, staffing companies or, um, yeah. you know, recruiting teams at large corporations? So uh, one of our largest verticals, we work with staffing and recruiting companies every day. That is, uh, we are a big partner inside the staffing and recruiting world. So, People G2 does background checks, employment screening, drug testing, uh, all of that. So if you need our help there, we can do that. We are integrated with all of the software, uh, staffing software companies you can think of. If you can name three right now, I guarantee we're probably integrated with them. So we do a lot in that space and we're happy to help anyone who needs our assistance. Uh, right now, a big thing that we're helping staffing clients with is we have a mobile uh, way to help them facilitate their background checks. So they don't have to have paperwork. They don't have to interact with people. They, people don't necessarily have a way to like sign and scan stuff. We can do it all through mobile and text messages. So that's been a big help for a lot of staffing companies right now. Um, as far as me, you can find me on LinkedIn, happy to connect or Twitter or wherever you, wherever you are on social, I'm probably there. Um, or Chris, the letter P like Patrick, Chris P .com is my personal website. And you can find my book on Amazon or wherever you buy your online books, uh, The Power of Company Culture. It's there. You can audible. Uh, you can get it uh, delivered to you, although it might not be till April. I think Amazon's uh, doing uh, I don't think my book is considered a vital product. Um, maybe we might disagree with that, but Amazon, I think, would disagree. So, But you can get it on ebook as well, so or Kindle or whatever it is. But uh, however you want to connect, I'm happy to do that. Awesome, Crystal. Th thanks a lot.